Good afternoon, my name is Carlos Vasquez. Uh, I'm a biology major. I had the opportunity of working this summer at the USDA Miami Station under the supervision of uh, Dr. Ray Schnell and Dr. Pilar Mo. And uh, I was involved in a project regarding cacao, the cacao tree. As you may know, cacao is the plant that gives us that wonderful product we call chocolate. And uh, the name of my presentation is Determining Genetic Resistance to Phytophthora in Cacao by Molecular Marker Fingerprinting. Phytophthora is, uh, is a fungal disease that attacks cacao plantations throughout the world, from the South Pacific, uh, Asia, Africa, to South America. It is a devastating disease. It is estimated that over 30% of the potential yield in the field is lost to this uh, fungal diseases pathogen. And this translates to over 800,000 metric tons of cacao lost worldwide every year with a value of over a billion dollars. And here is uh, what a cacao pod is a healthy cacao pot is supposed to look like. This is, the inside of the pot is where the chocolate comes from. And the first symptoms of, the, of this disease is uh, dark lesions or brown lesions that form on the outside of the, of the pot, as we see in this picture. These are the lesions. These lesions rapidly start spreading throughout the outside of the pot, and finally they, they make this uh, white line of uh, infected spores outside and these pores, once they come in contact with uh, a healthy plant, they will infest, uh, infect this plant. And this is the, the part once it starts having these lines of uh, white pores. And finally, the part is completely covered in, in black and it hardens on the outside as well as the inside as you see here in this picture. And at this point, the part is rendered useless and um, however, even at this stage, the pot does not detach uh, automatically from the tree, from the actual tree. It can actually last uh, attached to the tree for up to 18 months, making it very hard to eradicate this disease because the uh, spores are still uh, infesting other healthy plants. Other methods of, uh, of the propagation of this disease is through heavy rain, heavy wind, Insects, birds, rodents, bats, it's very hard to control. However, chocolate lovers should not despair. There's hope. <laughs> uh, the, according to data deposited at the International Cacao Germplasm Database, uh, different scientific teams working in different projects in cacao throughout the world have identified genotypes that are resistant to this disease. Well, obviously there are other genotypes that are susceptible. However, Different scientific teams, labs have identified or have labeled some genotypes as both. One labels it as resistant and another labels it as susceptible. And here's where the purpose of our project comes in. The purpose of our uh, project is to identify the genetic similarities between those samples, uh, those uh, samples that are resistant uh, to the disease as well as those that are susceptible to phytophthora. We'll conduct this experiment by getting um, genetic uh, samples or samples from the three main groups. Uh, sorry. Three main groups are susceptible, resistant, and those are labeled as both. And this, the similarities between those genotypes will be identified through 90 different primers that have been known to work well with uh, cacao in other scientific investigations. Eventually, the significance of this, of this project is that eventually, this could be a stepping stone in identifying the gene or a group of genes that is responsible for the resistance or susceptibility of the cacao to phytophthora. This will, in turn, help growers better uh, prevent the, this disease in the field and through uh, selective breeding programs or genetic modification in the lab. And this obviously it will have a major economic impact in, in the cacao industry. The first step in our project was the sample collection. We received 
96 different samples from cultivars from around the world, and the samples are in the form of a cacao leaf, just like this one. And from these leaves, we actually extract the DNA, which is our next step. The DNA extraction was done using a fast DNA spin kit. This spin kit is uh, very good because it's user friendly, brings all the, um, the tubes and chemicals that we need to extract the DNA. It has the binding matrix, it brings the SDS to elude the DNA in the final step. But above all, it's very fast as its name implies, and it has a very good DNA yield at the end. Next, the next step will be to quantify these DNA samples. Each one of them is quantified using a CyberGreen quantification protocol. And CyberGreen is a chemical that intercalates into the DNA sample and absorbs blue light while emits green light. And it is read by the microplate fluorescence reader that you see here in this picture. And it gives you an, a numerical value which is, uh, which tells us the actual quantity of the DNA in that sample. And then we deem it um, good to go on to the next uh, step, or we, uh, we get another sample and we refuse it. The next step is to amplify that DNA, and we use the polymerase chain reaction uh, technique in order to do this. The reason why we amplify the DNA is because the USDA, as a world leader in agricultural research, wants to keep a DNA data bank of all the cultivars that we work with uh, in this uh, project, as well as other projects that might be working on at this stage. And the three main steps in the uh, PCR is the denaturation, once the temperature is uh, raised, uh, or I don't raise it, it's a thermocycler that you see here. Uh, once the temperature is raised, uh, then the temperature is lower and the heating <coughs> process uh, takes place and that is when the actual primers anneal. And the elongation actually takes place once the temperature is already raised again. And these three uh, steps, they are repeated over and over again in a cyclic fashion until you get a very large amount of DNA from a tiny initial amount. And next, the very next step is to do the DNA analysis, and this was done using the 3730 DNA analyzer. And this is the machine, the instrument that you see here in this picture. This is a great instrument. It performs capillary electrophoresis. It's very fast. It uses, it can read. Uh, or analyze 200 to 400 base pairs in less than 20 minutes. And uh, it holds here, what you see here are the plates, um, the rocks plates that we put there, and it can hold up to 16 96 well plates at one time. And uh, the data output that we get is in a numerical value that represents the DNA fragment size of the alleles in each sample. Then this uh, data output, we actually have to score the alleles using a gene mapper software. And uh, it is scored using a determined uh, marker or standard. In our case, we use the GeneScan 400HD or ROX400. Uh, but this is by no means is the only standard that you could have used, in, or at least that is available in the market. For our experiment, is the one that works the best. And here is a sample of several standards. Every different color is a different standard. Ours is the red one. And uh, like I said, it's the one that works the best for our experiment. And this is the actual, what you will see once you start scoring these alleles. And the alleles, uh, you see here, th these blue peaks are the ones that you will get this um, you will score. And here is one individual, this is another individual. And the y, uh, in the x-axis is the main number that we're concerned with. These are the base pairs. And here on the y-axis, uh, this number is important because it, gives, uh, it tells us the quantity of the DNA in each sample. Uh, the higher the number, the better the DNA sample. If, um, it, 
in our experiment, we did not consider anything under 200 units. And uh, the, even though Gene Mapper is able to score uh, samples as low as 50, but we didn't feel like that was a, a safe way to go. 200 was our cutoff line. If you could determine the their, uh, their base pairs quite easily, their peaks, because not all of them look that pretty. Some of them are kind of messy. And then this is an ongoing experiment. These are only partial results that are in a uh, table format. And uh, I just want to show you a few of them, but imagine here the sample number in this column, it will be 96 of them. And here we have the primers. In this case, we have CIRAT001, CIRAT002, and CIRAT037. And, um, but we will have 90 of them on this. So this will be a very big table. Uh, for each primer, on each sample, we have allele 1 and allele 2. And these numbers are just the base pairs that we got from scoring the alleles in the previous, like we saw in the previous slide. And here, for instance, we would see that uh, this sample, uh, TC0017, has on allele 1, 126 pairs, and allele 2, 138 pairs, um, base pairs. If we identify that all the, the samples that are resistant, for instance, uh, have the allele on allele 1 is 126, and allele 2 is 138, then we have established a, a relationship, a correlation between 0, 0, 0, 1 and that and the, resist, uh, the resistant uh, and on that cultivar for allele on allele with the base pairs 126 and 138. Same thing, for instance, if we find in zero uh, 032 uh, samples, all the samples that are susceptible have the alleles at two, uh, 198 and 200 or 200 and 200, then we would find a relationship between the susceptibility of the to the disease and that specific primer, in this case, uh, CIRAD 032 and the allele 1 and 2. Uh, most of the primers we suspect will not have a, a clear cut relationship between the, the marker and the, and the, the actual uh, susceptibility or resistance to the disease. And that's why we have 90 of them and we're sort of throwing things on the wall, see what sticks. So it's a trial and error process. And so once again, these are very partial results. Uh, this, uh, most of it is still to be done. So the future prospect of this uh, project is to finish scoring all the gene mapper projects, which is still not done. Uh, we will have to re uh, do some repeat some reactions that did not uh, come out due to incorrect sizing uh, at the, in the step of the 3730 DNA analyzer. And um, this we will have to do by changing the injection time or the voltage in order to get a higher peaks. Also, sometimes if that doesn't work, we will have to reamplify the DNA because perhaps that was the, the mistake or we didn't. You know. Let it Act out your yeah. slides. So the, <laughs> the repeated, uh, we will have to repeat some specific uh, reactions with specific samples, like I said, due to incorrect sizing or DNA amplification. And the very final step, which will be done by Dr. Chanel, who is the leading scientist in this investigation, will be to determine the allele configuration of the genotypes that are resistant and susceptible uh, to fight doctor. And uh, before I finish, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mo, who has been a wonderful liaison between the USDA and St. Thomas University. Also, Dr. Ray Chanel, who is the, like I said, the leading investigator on the project. Cecile Tondo, my direct uh, mentor. Uh, Emmer Bajuelos, who conducted part of the, this is the second part of the bigger project. He conducted the first part and the entire staff at the USDA, also the 
uh, Science and Mathematics uh, Fellows Program here at SDU, and the MSEIT grant for funding this internship. Thank you. I'm looking like Okay, but but in the bigger scheme of the project, how many how many markers do you think you're gonna end up looking at? Well, this is like I said, this is only preliminary results. Actually, even after all these negative markers that we I have reactions that I have done with these markers, we will probably have to look to many many more. Um, Dr. Schnell has said uh, what he has said is that he has. He has looked into the scientific data the, or literature that is out there, and he thinks that these 90 markers that he, that he already chose are the most likely to render some viable um, data in this experiment. But if we see that there is no correlation, you know, no correlation between them, then I guess the scope of the the experiment will have to be uh, enhanced. The, the markers cover um, all of the chromosomes, I guess, in the, mm -hmm. the plant. So there's a few markers per chromosome? Yes. Yes, yes uh, that is what he wants. He is using you know, the, a large um, uh, range of these markers, not only a few, but a uh, whole bunch of them. And uh, the plants that you use, they were taken at random, or some of them were genetically related? That is uh, the reason why there was a first part to the experiment. It was um, that since uh, at the ICGD, they were, the genotypes were already labeled, but some of them seemed to be mislabeled. And that's what uh, Emmer Bajuelos did before. He fingerprinted all these plants and the idea of the project is not to make a, a family tree of this but uh, it does help in, in, in the bigger picture and she wanted to know if some of the, due to mislabeling, some of the genotypes that were labeled as resistant by one lab or by another was labeled as susceptible, they were the same and that's why she did the, the fingerprinting as the, per, uh, as the first part of this experiment using microsatellites. And, uh, but I don't know if that answers your question. It, it answers it. It's just like if, um, let's say, if I was doing your project, but I was doing it with mice instead mm -hmm. of with plants, right? What I would do is I'd have one plant, right, that would be um, susceptible to the disease, and one plant that's resistant to the disease. And I genotype that plant as much as even sequence it because yeah. now the sequencing is getting yes. so much cheaper. Then I would cross those plants, right, make make them breed, and I would see the progeny and determine which ones in those progeny were resistant, which ones were susceptible, and I'd sequence all of those. So then I could tell um, they, they both ha should have parental DNA yes. from the plant. So what region is, you know, basically conserved or missing in the ones that are resistant, susceptible? So I was wondering that would be know. very helpful, but that is uh, that's why the fingerprinting using microsatellites was done before in order to like, segregate all of this uh, because the um, cultivars were taken from many different parts from around the world. So, any more questions? Thank you.